All right. Looks like Thursday technical issues are going to continue. So I think what we're going to do is uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and do this uh, on the Zoom call. And I think uh, this time a little change. We won't do we won't do the live streaming a bit of it. Uh, so let's see how that how that goes. But you know, thank you to those of us, those of you who have joined uh, for another edition of uh, IFF's uh, quarterly members call, where we talk you through. Uh, and essentially hold ourselves accountable to you, our members who support us and enable us to do uh, the work that uh, that we do, right? And this, of course, we're talking about uh, the three months of uh, April, May, and June, where there was a tiny insignificant thing going on in the country. If you blinked and missed it, you may have you may have missed it. If you blinked, you may have missed it completely. Uh, our general elections. Uh, so you know that expect that to feature uh, heavily during our call. But the reason I'm I'm starting. Uh, with that, and I want to address this early, and that also goes into the theme of uh, you know the the call today. Uh, and if you can just move to the next slide, please, while I'm while I'm talking about this. Uh, so just before uh, the fourth of June, right? We at IFF we went through uh, this exercise where uh, we we went back. We, we you know we we thought to ourselves, uh, hey, why do we do this, right? Why are we doing what we're doing when some of us, many of us, could be out doing different other things right what different things what what is really driving us uh, to work in you know in the digital rights space uh, to work towards holding uh, the state accountable the, to work towards holding the platforms accountable and just ensuring that uh, people in india you know enjoy their constitutional rights on the internet right why why, why do we do this uh, so we went went through this exercise and that also uh, that sort of informed the, the post that we put out just shortly after the election results uh, called the persistence of resistance, right? And if you can just move to the next slide while I'm talking about it. The key idea there, right? The key idea there being that, uh, look, you know, we, uh, you know, all of us do this for a reason. Now, I won't go into that. Uh, you know, people shared uh, their different personal motivations, professional motivations for, for doing what they do. But the, the net was that, look, you know, whoever is in, whoever is in power, whoever is in government, uh, those of us here will be here to continue uh, to hold them accountable in in whatever ways we can. And the way to do that is to be persistent uh, about it and keep exercising hope, right? And uh, one of the things that we also took away from that conversation is that, uh, you know, uh, you you often hear that, you know, hope is not a strategy, hope is not a plan. Uh, but one of our takeaways from, from that collective exercise was that, you know, it may not be a strategy or a plan, but it is it is a muscle uh, that we must learn to that we must learn to exercise that we must learn to strengthen and keep at it uh, so that we can keep you know pushing and advancing uh, progressive values uh, you know in in society and and protecting and advancing digital rights for those of us uh, in 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 India right and uh, one of the things that enables us uh, to do that of course is uh, is people like you, people who who support us, uh, right? And if you can move to the uh, next slide, while well, I'm just going to go over this very quickly, uh, right? And this is this is where I where I normally make make the call that you know those of you who are joining on on live stream, you won't be able to see the exclusive uh, question and answer part that we go to you know that, that we do with our members, uh, right? But those of you who are here will will of course have the op will interact with with us and with the team. Uh, get to ask us questions about uh, about what we're doing, but ultimately, you know, it, it is you that we draw uh, our strength from, right? Both in terms of uh, motivation and and quite literally the ability uh, to keep to keep going, uh, and in in terms of you know in, in terms of financial support, and we we'll cover some of those uh, during the course of uh, of this conversation of of this presentation. But if if there is one message or one one thing that I can highlight to you is that you know we're extremely grateful uh, for your support uh, and, and as you will see we need your support we need more people uh, to to support us to enable us to keep us to keep on independently doing the work uh, that we're doing uh, with that I will now step out of the way and let you hear uh, what the people who actually do the work uh, at IFF have been doing. Uh, and and I'll turn it over first uh, to the litigation team, and and Gayatri will 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 start and take over and start walking us through what we've been uh, what the lit, lit team has been doing for the last three months. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, we are back with a bang now that summer vacations are over in the court of Delhi. 
and we're very happy to continue some of the great work that we're doing uh just for the vacations we had two new filings before the delhi high court uh the first challenge the complete blocking of the twitter account of hindutva watch an independent research initiative uh this is the first challenge of its type that challenges the blocking of an entire social media account before the delhi high court uh along with this petition we also filed another petition challenging the wholesale blocking of the entire websites of hindutva watch and india hate lab both of which monitored hate crimes and hate speech against marginalized communities in india uh now very briefly why are these challenges important we are seeing that wholesale content take down is shifting the is shifting from content specific take downs to user based prohibitions assuming that all future posts or all future content would fall afoul of section 69a and this is quite problematic as this has the ability to permanently ex- exclude certain users from the marketplace of ideas online these proceedings are vital for transparency in india's online censorship regime as mighty as you know and i'm sure you've heard us ad nauseum at this time saying this cites rule 16 the confidentiality provision of the blocking rules to rarely allow to rarely share reason blocking orders with content creators and give them the ability to challenge account challenge content takedowns uh now just very briefly uh, what arguments is this petition based on uh we are arguing that wholesale account blocking and wholesale website blocking uh in the manner it was done violates the principles of natural justice denying the right to fair hearing under article 21 and contradicting the supreme court's mandate in shreya singhal that said that if the originator and the intermediary can be identified both of them should be provided with a blocking prior should be provided a hearing prior to blocking and a reasoned order must be shared so that affected parties could assail the same before a competent court uh in this case once again as with most blocking challenges the blocking order was not provided to the petitioner contrary to shreya singhal uh the petition argues that wholesale account blocking and wholesale website blocking infringes on freedom of speech and the ability to pra- practice one's profession online infringing on article 191a and article 191g of the indian constitution uh section 69a does not permit the blocking of future content if you read closely it is phrased in past tense uh the block the wholesale account blocking and wholesale website blocking also falls a fall of the proportionality test as lesser restrictive measures such as specific content take down are also available i am pleased to share with you that the delhi high court was pleased to issue notice in both petitions and the next date of hearing for both of them is the july is july 26th we will keep you posted on what happens in these proceedings can we have the next slide please and finally it's almost a year and a half since the it rules 23 2023 that established a fact check unit to potentially take down all fake false and misleading content related to the business of the central government uh were notified by mit after securing a stay on the interim order on interim relief which was rejected by the bombay high court uh arguments commenced before the third judge of the bombay high court that is justice chandrakar uh during vaca- during this june initially the proceedings were listed but uh, the solicitor general sought an adjournment for the same finally the solicitor general comments arguments on the 1st and 2nd of july uh, the solicitor general shall now continue on behalf of the respondents on the 24th and 25th of july this shall be followed by a rejoinder by the petitioners on 29th 30th and 31st of july uh i have to keep you posted on what happens on those days uh now over to uh 
my colleague Meda, who has just joined IFF as a Freedom Innovation Fellow. Uh, hi everyone. I hope I am audible. Uh, I am Meda, and I've just joined IFF uh, as a Freedom Innovation Fellow, and I will be very succinctly taking you through the upcoming strategic litigation that IFF will be involved in. So, as Gayatri has already informed you about the two writ petitions in the Delhi High Court challenging the blocking of the Hindutva Watch and the Indian Hate Lab websites and Twitter uh, before the Delhi High Court are now listed on the 26th of July. Uh, also, the IT Rules Amendment 2023 uh, case before the Bombay High Court is now listed on the 24th and 25th of July, respectively. And then again on the 29th and 31st of July for the petitioner's rejoinder arguments. Uh, then we'll proceed to, proceed to other cases. So we have two cases listed in front of the Delhi High, Cro High Court. Uh, challenging the Central Information Commission's order in APAR versus uh, Ministry of Home Affairs and Saurabhdas versus CPIO. Uh, both the cases have been filed uh, against the CIC orders uh, as their petitioners had filed RTI seeking transparency regarding surveillance orders and uh, issued by the government and regarding the functioning of the Aragya Setu app respectively in both the cases. Uh, now, both the cases are in the final stages of hearing and we will keep you posted regarding that as well. Uh, moving on, IFF also represents a group of researchers uh, in a case before the Delhi High Court, uh, namely Elsevier versus Alexandra Elbakian, which is an infringement suit filed uh, by the prominent publishers seeking the blocking of digital libraries, uh, Sci-Hub and Libgen, which is something we've all used. Uh, we have filed an intervention application the same on behalf of a group of social science researchers who will be adversely affected if the websites are blocked. Uh, then IFF is also providing legal assistance in challenges to the RTI rules 2021. And the matter is now listed on the 14th of August in the Delhi High Court. Just to provide a little background uh, on this case, in March 2022, 20, uh, 2024 this year, the Supreme Court transferred the uh, to the Delhi High Court all the petitions that were filed across the country challenging the constitutionality of the IT rules uh, 2021 and all the transfer petitions filed by the Union of India seeking the transfer petitions uh, challenging the constitution constitutionality before the Supreme Court. Uh, other than this, lastly, we also have Tanul Thakur versus Union of, Union of India, which is a petition filed for the arbitrary blocking of journalist Tanul Thakur's satirical website, Dowry Calculator. In the last hearing, the Union of India informed the Delhi High Court that the Inter-Ministerial Committee had rejected the proposal to provide a suitable disclaimer uh, for the, to un unblock the website. Uh, and the Delhi High Court then recommended and directed the Union of India to file a report of the IMC in a sealed cover. So we'll see what happens in the next hearing. Uh, we are very excited and hopeful for the coming quarter. And you can follow our litigation work on IFF in court on Twitter. Thank you. Uh, I am handing over to my friend Angela now for, for updates on our transparency. What a good. Uh Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am a Freedom Innovation Fellow at IFF. Uh, I am happy to put up this quick report on behalf of Transparency Vertical at IFF. This quarter, we filed total 211 RTI requests and 32 first appeals. So, these were strategically planned after brainstorming on the evolving issues pertaining to digital rights. We filed most of our RTIs to reflect our goal to get transparency around censorship, surveillance, Lok Sabha elections, use of AI innovations and governance, formation of fact check units by different states, and other policy consultations by the government as well. Uh, so let me take you through some key highlights and responses that we got in this endeavor. And we are also waiting for some of the responses on our RTIs, which are being passed around within various departments. This quarter, we saw the government's increasing interest in using AI in almost all the aspects of governance. We got to know that the Minister of Agriculture was conducting a digital crop survey using AI in some states. 
We inquired about it and got very informative response from them. We were told that the ministry conducted a pilot digital crop survey for Rabi and Kharif in 11 states by using an in-house developed mobile app. It also informed us about the data which was collected during the survey. And it further told us about its plan to roll out nationwide this digital crop survey from Kharif 2020 core onwards. Uh, the next, uh, our RTI was related to a very problematic circular which was issued on 8th May by the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. This from reporting on a particular case in pursuance of the Rajasthan High Court's order. So we got concerned about the order and what it meant for the freedom of press, freedom of speech and expressions, and citizens' right to the information. We asked MIB about the circular, its binding nature, consequences of non-compliance of the circular, and the legal basis for issuing such kind of circulars. Uh, initially, we did not get the response from the press section of the ministry, but later, uh, we got the response to some of our queries. MIB cited the cable television network and rules to assert the binding nature of the circular and also told us that it is the legal basis for issuing such kind of circulars. Uh, now we are in the process of analyzing what this means for the fundamental rights of the citizens and we are also planning to publish a blog post on this issue. Uh, next slide, slide please. So now comes our most controversial yet interesting endeavors where we tried to get one policy document from the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Information and Technology regarding the implementation of FRIT. This document was supposedly presented by the Minister of Education at the National Conference of Chief, Sec Chief Secretaries. Uh, just to evade the response, the Minister has transferred it 25 times in the past two months since filing of this RTI request. It was transferred just between four departments from the Ministry of Information and Technology and Ministry of Education. Uh, next slide. Similarly, we have got interesting findings on an extensive approach which we initiated last quarter to gather information on all public-private partnership between Starco Technologies and union and state governments. So in total, we filed RTIs to 27 states and the union government. We got varied responses to them. Six states completely denied having any partnership with the Starco Technologies and the four states stated that the information asked is outside the scope of the public authority and thus they cannot make it available with us. Uh, among all these states, only the Haryana government admitted that Starco was empaneled with Saturn. It is a nodal agency for computerization, procurement of computer systems for the state of Haryana. Uh, on further analysis of response, we also concluded that the Haryana government's contract with the Staku expired in February 2021 only and currently the Staku was not engaged in any project or work by the ICT division. For other 16 states, we are still awaiting the response. Now I hand over it to Robaya, my co-fellow, for other information. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rubaya. I'm a Freedom Innovation Fellow at IFF. So, previous slide, please. So, regarding the um, RTIs that we filed to ECI on takedown orders issued to social media platforms, we got an inadequate response from ECI to our seven RTIs seeking information on takedown orders issued to ByteDance, Facebook, Google, ShareChat, X, and WhatsApp and also statistical information on the content takedown orders issued to all social media platforms from last year till the date of filing of RTIs. Though ECI gave us the number of takedown orders, which totaled 55, it refused to provide the copies of these orders, citing Section 81J of the RTI Act 2005 and the legal precedent laid down in Bihar Durve versus CPIO, Election Commission of India. It further cited the Voluntary Code of Ethics as a legal basis for issuing such orders and did not specify the criteria for objectionable content and told us to refer to the Handbook of Media Matters for CEOs and DEOs available on ICI's uh, website, ECI's website. Since the response from ECI was incomplete and inadequate, we have filed the first appeals and await response. Throughout these endeavors, we continue to uphold transparency and accountability as we navigate complex issues impacting digital freedoms and governance. Thank you. Over to you, Disha. 
Hi, thanks for that, Rubaiya. My name is Disha. I'm an Associate Policy Counsel with IFF, and um, I'm happy to introduce you to the policy team at IFF. And um, much like the lit team, we also came with a bang. We never left. There was always so much to do. But this quarter marked elections, and that meant we widened our stakeholder engagement to many other parties as we, um, than we usually do. So, of course, we had engagement with governments and, interestingly, also international stakeholders this time around, um, which I will cover and uh, my um, colleagues will cover in a minute. Um, but, yeah, policy um, vertical and the team here continues to engage with stakeholders wherever possible, participate in consultations wherever possible, support the transparency vertical on a daily basis. So let me take you through some of the key changes that happened in the quarter. Next slide, please. So this quarter saw the implementation of legislations are uh, very varied in nature and extent as well. Um, two of the most controversial controversial ones are on the screen with you right now. Um, on 1st July, the criminal laws, the three criminal laws to overhaul the criminal justice system in India were implemented. And uh, although that falls outside the ambit of the quarter, we did anticipate a lot of work um, in and analyzing what this means to on digital rights and for digital rights and how certain sections and provisions of these acts can impact you know our right to free speech our right to privacy in the sense of um, you know digital evidence now being included uh, as part of evidence very uh, officially so within these laws and uh, what what that means for device search and seizure because the laws make room for entire devices to be confiscated just to uh, take um, you know digital evidence into custody so we are in the process of analyzing this very deeply we already have an explainer out um, as of um, i think three months ago and uh, we would also be publishing a series of detailed explainer on how these very controversial and honestly hollow laws um, impact digital rights. I will invite my colleague Tejasi to talk a little bit about the Telecom Act and uh, take the conversation further. Thank you, Disha. Um, right, controversial is uh, just about right. So um, on June 21st, the Ministry of Communications notified certain sections of the Telecom Act. Now the Telecom Act itself had uh, been uh, passed last year in December and the certain sections that were notified went into effect on June 26th. So um, uh, in the midst of that, on June 25, uh, 25th, we published an analysis of whether these sections have implications for digital rights. Um, some sections of note uh, include the definition section for telecommunication services, the duties imposed on users, the union government's power to possess, suspend, intercept, detain any telecommunication services. Um, and there's a lot more. So there's an there's a post on a website that you can read. But if I have to summarize the implications of the Telecom Act, um, and especially with these this partial notification um, in a sentence for you, uh, I guess it's that in addition to retaining several of the provisions that centralized power and control with the executive, it the Telecom Act has created new ones, new powers uh, that do so. And it also misses an opportunity to introduce reform in the sector, which was much needed. Now, if you go to the next slide, um, something we do at IFF as a practice, whenever there is a new appointment in the government, especially uh, in a ministry that's relevant to us that we engage with, we write to them, welcoming them to their role and offering assistance on key digital rights issues. Um, recently, as the new government took oath for the 2024-2029 term, members were appointed to the Council of Ministers in June. We wrote to the appointed ministers of Ministry of IT, Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, DOT, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, mm -hmm. Ministry of Civil Aviation, and Ministry of Consumer Affairs. Now, um, you can read up our post on our website, which summarizes all of our suggestions and area of focus for each ministry. So these are a total of six letters. Um, but side note, if you have or in the future will come across a reel about Lady Whistledown mentioning our letters, just know that it was the real Lady Whistledown from the popular Netflix show and not an IFF star for posing as an imposter. Um, but that's a fun little uh, project that we did. All of you, I encourage all of you to take a look. Now, we can't mention the new government and the new term without talking about general elections. So I will hand it over to Shravni, um, who will walk you through our exciting and several election-related outputs. 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Shravni. I am a Freedom Innovation Fellow at IFF. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. In the last quarter, we witnessed India's largest ever general election. To do our part in ensuring electoral integrity, we launched our election website, freeandfair.in. Our intention was to track, document, and analyze how technology shapes the electoral process. During our work, we identified about four stakeholders who play a major role in the election process. First, the Election Commission of India, second, the political parties, third, the platforms, and most importantly, the motors. Can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. The selection season was marked by widespread use of technology to create deceptive or misleading content like cheap fakes and deep fakes. We followed this trend closely during the elections since various studies have shown that AI-powered disinformation campaigns can influence voter behavior by spreading false narratives and amplifying divisive content. The response of the most important stakeholder, the ECI, was quite delayed in this matter. Only after voting for two of the seven phases for the Lok Sabha seats had ended did the ECI send a letter to all the national and state political parties, cautioning them against the use of AI-generated content, specifically deepfakes. If you have been following our work around the IT rules, you know that we have raised concerns consistently about the potential misuse through subjective application and selective enforcement of undefined terms like misinformation, patently false, untrue in legislation. We raised similar concerns in this letter that we wrote to ECI regarding usage of these terms in its letter to the political parties. We all remember the Ranveer Singh and Amir Khan political deepfakes, which had gone viral during the election cycle. These were instances of manipulated media of high-profile public figures expressing support for a political party. In April and May, we wrote letters to the BJP and the INC highlighting their responsibility of not endorsing any sort of deceptive or misleading synthetic content, even if it disproportionately favors them. In our letter to the ECI, we mentioned that they failed to direct the political parties and its representatives to advocate against such manipulated media, even ones that lead to a favorable outcome for them. ECI also failed to take notice of hate speech in spite of wide coverage of communal content being posted online. The ECI released its Model Code of Conduct or MCC Enforcement Report in mid-May. We appreciated the intent of transparency, but there were critical gaps in their response. We published a thread on Twitter and subsequently a detailed analysis regarding the ECI's delayed inadequate and selective action in addressing crucial issues like the use of deep fakes and other forms of edited and distorted content, and its failure to take action on divisive statements being spread by parties. As voters, we have to go through, we go through targeted outreach, or what is commonly known as vote bank politics. We did a detailed analysis of how in recent years, parties are able to extract and collect a lot of personal information about voters through questionable means of collecting demographic data, like tapping into government databases and accessing beneficiary information through online surveys or political apps. In continuation of our effort to see our constitutionally guaranteed digital rights upheld in party, manifest party manifestos, we had mentioned in our last quarterly call that we'll publish a comprehensive analysis post where we assess each of the five parties, INC, BJP, DMK, CPIM, and TMC's manifestos and their tech-related promises. It is now available on our website, freeandfair.in. Please do check it out. We know that how hard it was to keep track of all that AI-generated content dominating the news cycle and social media platforms this election season. So we came up with the TAC tracker, Digital Rights Are Going Great, Drag where we tracked all digital rights violations and absurdities occurring during the election cycle. Elections may be over, but we must revisit the digital rights violations from the season so we can better inform ourselves, the government, about their intent interventions through an analysis moving forward. For all election-related highlights and lowlights, Digital Rights Edition, please visit our website, freeandfair.in. Thank you. I now hand it over to Tejasi. Thank you, Shavni. 
So last quarter, we walked you through our cybersecurity report, quarterly report, which included a list and an unfortunately long one about the various data breaches and vulnerabilities that happened between January and March. Now, we recently published a similar quarterly report recapping the second quarter and the various cybersecurity incidents since April. As you can see on the slide, private entities as well as government portals, both at the union and state level, were affected by data breaches this quarter. Some notable examples are the ICIC Bank, iMobile app, Dropbox, Tamil Nadu Government Police Facial Recognition Technology Portal, and the Telangana Police Network. Now, the last two state-level breaches are worth getting into in a little more depth, and that we will, but in a while. For now, I will leave you with the thought that these never-ending cybersecurity incidents raise concerns about the detection and response capabilities of um, India cybersecurity authorities. Um, it also makes us wonder if the protections and safeguards that are uh, listed and mentioned under the Data Protection Act are sufficient. Um, by the way, our quarterly reports are not the only resource for tracking breaches. You can find a non-exhaustive list of data breaches in the country uh, since 2020 on a publicly accessible database, which is called Plug the Breach. Uh, it's an IFF project, and we would love your feedback on it. Now, coming to one of the most talked about uh, draft bills of this quarter, and this was talked about across industry and civil society, the Digital Competition Bill. Now, the bill uh, deals with an extremely complex topic, the regulation of digital markets. And so when the bill was released for a month-long consultation, several stakeholders felt that it wasn't enough time to sort of meaningfully engage with the bill. Um, so IFF uh, wrote a letter to the MCA and also signed an open letter asking for an extension. Later, the ministry did grant an extension for a month. Coming to um, our final submission and the comments that we sent, we identified and made recommendations on four broad points. The first one obviously was frictions in the consultation process. Other than the fact that it was inadequate, it was also there were also certain limitations and barriers in participation um, in the overall process. So we pointed those out. The second thing that we identified were shortcomings in the data protection law because the bill did sort of rely on the DPA, uh, D D Digital uh, Personal Data Protection Act for definitions. So we did sort of highlight the shortcomings uh, under the act. The third thing we highlighted was uh, potential regulatory overlap that the digital competition can have, will can have with other existing and upcoming laws and regulations, such as the Digital India Act um, or the IT rules. And lastly, the regulatory approach that was proposed by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs in the bill. Now, the proposed approach was of an ex ante regulation to address anti-competitive practices in the market and to sort of bring about a level playing field. Now, um, and ex ante is essentially regulation in anticipation of upcoming potential issues. So it's preemptive pre in sorts. Um, now, several stakeholders expressed doubts about the efficiency and effectiveness of such an approach. And we have also expanded on this argument in our submission. So please do take a look. And I will also encourage you to engage in this process, even though the consultation uh, process is over. Uh, if you do want to like read about it, we are happy to share resources and even have a conversation with you because this is an extremely important topic that can have implications, not just for entities, but um, user experience and choice. So do engage right to the ministry. Um, we are happy to help and assist on that as well. But to summarize our submission in a line, um, although the MCA has its reasons for taking um, an ex ante approach and regulating the digital market, we believe that there is still scope and still need to develop expertise on uh, the various unique and varied market risks that we know. Um, that currently are there and we need extensive digital market studies before we can come to a conclusion on what is the best way forward. Um, I will now hand it over to my colleague, Disha. Thanks for that, Tejasi. Can we shift to the other slide, please? So I'm going to stay um, with you for a minute here. I'm also mindful of the time, so I need to run through many different things that the policy verdict team has achieved in the quarter. Um, so I'm going to start 
you know, I'm going to carry on the conversation around consultations. And uh, what was different this quarter is that we not only obviously engaged with the pertinent national level consultations, but we also extended our horizons to engaging with international stakeholders uh, with regards to important topics of um, engagement and important reporting that we could do. One such example, and I think something that we're really proud to put out and present, uh, was IFS submission to the Human Rights Committee, which is conducting its fourth periodic review of India with the sense of how human rights were implemented and respected in India for the last five years. Um, we're very happy to put together a report that is very long and very comprehensive and very uh, all-encompassing with regards to how digital rights and freedoms were affected in India in the five years. And um, that report is also a summary of everything IFF has done so far because um, it, it's, it was a really beautiful moment for us to put it on a paper. And it was also around the time that we were heading towards the Lok Sabha election result. Um, so overall, a lot of introspection happened over the week and we were able to comprehensively jot it down in this quite a long report. So I would encourage all of you to please go read it as well. And uh, we're positive that the committee will find use in it and um, you know be able to conduct a comprehensive review of India as well. Uh, next slide, please. I'll uh, speed run through two more consultations that we did, a total of five for the quarter. Um, but on the theme of international consultations, we also engaged with the World Health Organization on their guidelines on how to regulate genomic health data or genetic data and uh, how that can be accessed by uh, researchers and companies. This is an uncharted territory for IFF, but we're very happy to step into it. And uh, we were able to give some uh, good, I think, uh, perspectives on how data protection and health data functions in not only India, but uh, countries of the global south um, and present our findings over there. Please also, uh, spare some time to read this as well. It's quite interesting and it's an emerging area of discussion uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. On the similar veins, we engaged with the UN um, Development Program on their interim report on DPIs, digital public infrastructure and how it can be, uh, how guardrails can be drawn around it and the safety and uh, other sort of risks associated with it was put down in an interim report by a working group under the UNDP and under the UNDP Tech Envoy. And we were able to um, sort of, they invited feedback on the report um, in order for us to, for all civil society to identify flaws and gaps and give feedback uh, to, the, to that effect. And we were able to give, um, I think a list of uh, feedback drawing from our experience as a country with digital public infrastructure. Um, in these submissions, we uh, touch upon things like the need to define digital, uh, digital public infrastructure and the lack thereof in India currently, the suitability of DPI, uh, in each jurisdiction, the consent and privacy uh, risks um, associated with imposing digital public infrastructure across such a large and wide and diverse country, and then uh, risks of surveillance, risks of uh, promoting public-private partnership without adequate governance and accountability measures were all included in our submission as well. Uh, this report and our feedback to this report is also live on our website, so please do check it out. Um, next slide, please. So in this quarter, we were able to send 18 letters across the roster. Some of these also engaged with um, in electoral contexts. But let me uh, shed light on two fundamental ways in which we engaged with police forces. So one, I'll start with a more minor one, which was the Tamil Nadu facial recognition uh, portal leak. Here we had a situation where the Tamil Nadu state was over-reliant on a, on a facial recognition system to identify and verify criminals in the state. And they were drawing these powers from colonial legislation, of course, and they had a very wide and varied database drawing from the Central Criminal Identification System, which is the CCTNS. And um, of I mean, that exact portal suffered a breach, um, a result of which was a lot of facial recognition reports and personal data corresponding to police officers and the criminals was out in the public. Um, this We used this event to obviously draw attention to the gravity of such a thing, but also to the fact that there are public calls to ban the scan. Amnesty has re released a call some years ago of hashtag ban the scan, wherein there is an active need to ban facial recognition technologies in policing. And this was an example of why that's so necessary. But of course, that didn't stop there. Um, in a week in May, Telangana police network and the infrastructure suffered three massive breaches 
uh, one of which also had facial recognition technology engaged with it and carried with it a lot of personal sensitive facial data of not only of obviously criminals and also suspects. Um, of the three breaches, one happened on a Hawkeye on the citizen facing Hawkeye app. One happened to their own uh, TS Corp app that the police use to identify criminals and to log all the all the information. And the third happened to their SMS service. And we obviously responded to this with um, an explainer, a deep dive into what happened, uh, the uh, different mysteries and allegations surrounding uh, the TS Corp, which, you know, a lot of cybersecurity experts even flagged that the Telangana police has access to information that it absolutely should not. Like it perfectly had uh, um, access to hotel visitor logs and guest logs uh, in the state of Telangana. Uh, so we tracked all of that. We released a video explainer um, in collaboration with Anurj Nakade. And we also wrote to the Telangana government saying, hey, I mean, what are you doing? And giving them certain recommendations on how to better handle a cybersecurity incident of this um, gravity and of this extent, because they handled it quite poorly. Uh, so I would encourage all of you to check those resources out. Um, and lastly, let's talk about it. The elephant in the room. Next slide, please. Let's talk about Dijiyatra, right? So an interesting thing happened this quarter, of course, is that um, we were approached by the Dijiyatra Foundation for what seemed like a closed door conversation, wherein they would they would acquaint us with the ecosystem behind Digiatra service. Um, our response to that, which has been made public and a blog post and an explainer to that effect has also been published, was that instead of a closed door meeting, we would happily engage in an open forum where all of civil society has an opportunity to voice their concerns and to understand the ecosystem better because IFF is not the only voice in the space and IFF is also not a tech expert or a cybersecurity expert. None of us are. Uh, so for us to be able to make sense of that information, um, it needs to be out in the public and it needs to be an open conversation, right? And this draws from our incessant advocacy with Digiatra to instill transparency ac and accountability within the service from the get-go and within its design. And we keep pushing uh, it to them for the last two years that you need to have transparency. Um, so this sort of an ask and this correspondence that we had with Digiatra was um, just an echo of that exact sentiment. Um, I will actually stop there and pass it on to Tejasi to round it out and um, conclude for the policy team. Thank you. Um, hi, I'll be going for the community policy team. I believe the policy team is done. Um, hi, everyone. I am Anjane. I am a digital literacy intern here at IFF. And yeah, I've been here for seven months. My experience has been extremely engaging, enriching, and nourishing. It's As a law student, it's been perfect to be honing my policy advocacy and communication skills in such a um, great and learned team. Uh, I will be talking about the community operations team. And as you can see, we've had our own Brad summer, and it's been a quite a busy summer with um, so much that we have been up to with the general elections having been just um, concluded. So yeah, I'll walk you through everything. And so you can see our public campaigns and doom scrolling. You, you, we've been quite active on all of our social media channels, um, especially on Instagram. You might have noticed quite a shift away from our traditional sort of carousel content. And uh, it's no secret that the push for algorithmic content has been towards short form scrolling video content. And that's something that we have uh, noticed and responded to. And as as a, an advocacy organization, obviously we have to. Uh, and as you can see, our, our major campaign that we concluded this quarter was free and fair, hashtag free and fair. Um, so we had kept a keen eye in which uh, ways the technology and digital technology shaped the electoral process for us Indians. Uh, we heard the community and we ramped up our efforts to protect your digital rights. This was a massive, massive combined effort from the policy and community verticals here at IFF. And I'd like to thank all of them. And as well as you, our community, our super team of super volunteers helped create the website uh, for our campaign. And we couldn't thank them enough. Uh, also, as we've already mentioned, digital rights are going great. We'll live on solo. So yeah, um, keep an eye on for that. And we will keep continue to keep updating it with um, any violations and absurd developments 
that we see in the realm of digital rights. Um, as uh, my colleagues have already mentioned, you might have noticed a reel with where we're quilling Lady Whistledown quills, handwritten le letters to ministers, the newly minted ministers. So post elections, we ramp up our efforts as a practice to engage with the new ministries. And we sent min letters to ministries urging their attention on a host of digital rights issues. So um, as I've already mentioned, keeping with the current social media platform climate, where vertical scrolling video has found a huge algorithmic push. Um, this resulted in the carousel format, our traditional carousel format, to be left in the dust. So we've been continuously experimenting with new formats, new uh, ideas. And this Bridgerton Reel was a very fun uh, two-day collaborative effort between all the teams here at IFF. And it was a great blast to shoot. And we had loads of fun. And hopefully you had loads of fun. And if you see the QR code on the bottom right of your screen, you can scan it and go to the YouTube link for our video. Hopefully you like it. Um, continuing the video trend, um, you'll see me repeat that word a lot. Um, we've been collaborating with Anuj Nakade, as Desha mentioned, added it as if I know you on Instagram and YouTube to create long form explainer videos on IFF related topics. Uh, the latest one was the data breaches on the TS Corp app, the TS Corp Hawkeye and the Telangana SMS uh, delivery service, which was, we've been receiving very positive uh, engagement from our community. And that has been going on for quite a while now. So this collaborative effort has been also a, an endeavor in us experimenting with these formats. And yes, uh, uh, you will see more reels uh, and everything from our John Oliver fan cams to um, our more traditional, you know, incessant posting, as Isha mentioned, on Dejiatra. And hopefully you will like it all and our uh, community expands all of it. I will now hand off to Ashlesh. Hello, uh, am I audible? Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Anshne. Uh, and it's great to see you folks again. This quarter has been a lot of things. Some fresh energy post the June saga, 5x of the fresh, and some same old challenges. The budget session is coming up, and so are reportedly the DPDPA rules, along with, they say, a worse version of the broadcasting bill. But we remain charged and chaotic. I think we thrive in the chaos of the landscape that is digital rights in India. Uh, but I'm here to walk you through uh, some of our fun community events we've been up to. This quarter, we uh, uh, began with uh, black, box, black box governance, a very important conversation around automated welfare delivery systems and the adverse impact of that on lives of people. For the session, we had Tapasya from the Reporters Collective, David Joshi, an independent researcher, and David Nolan of Amnesty Tech. Uh, next, we partnered up with Goethe Institute uh, New Delhi to put together uh, Citizens or Subjects, a very interactive fishbowl discussion around us, the individual, in the age of rampant platformization, the resulting power imbalances, and what it means to be a human in the middle of all of this. We were joined by Dr. Shivangi Narayan, uh, Shashank Mohan from CCG, and Uttara Ganesh, uh, Head of Public Policy at SNAP. Coming up next, we have a very exciting collaboration with the Community Library Project, where we are working with the young adult leads of the TCLB to bring the easy print edition of the Glassroom exhibition and other excellent digital literacy interventions produced and supported by Tactical Tech to the libraries of TCLB in around three branches in Delhi. Uh, along with that, uh, IFF has also been working with Goethe, Quicksand Studios, and Berlin's Tactical Tech as we are putting together a series of small events and a two-day workshop around the theme of the data fight state and platformization. But, 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 more importantly, Privacy Supreme, our flagship event, is coming back for the 8th edition. August 22, mark the dates. We can't wait to have you all and uh, for you to see what inst uh, interesting conversations we are cooking. Uh, that's it from me. Over to you, Purvay. Thank you, Shlish. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Purvay. I'm the Community and Fundraising Associate at IFF. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank every one of you. 
uh, who have joined us. It is only because of members and donors like you that IFF is sustained through the toughest of the times. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? So here is an illustration of our income and expense for the past quarter. Uh, this quarter, we were fortunate to receive some organizational donations and grants, which helped us cover most of our expenses. However, our consistent support comes from recurring members like you guys. Um, our recurring donations and one-time donations made by members at IFF have experienced a downward trend. Can we please move on to the next slide? Our existing member base is only 143 members while 89 memberships are currently hoarded. Uh, this quarter, we also we were able to successfully dispatch the Form 10B to all our donors who donated to us in the last financial year. If by any chance we miss sending yours, please do let us know. Uh, looking ahead, we aspire to um, engage more community members in our fundraising efforts. And to facilitate this, we will focus on fixing and streamlining a few pressing issues with our donor tech, especially ERP Next and Razorpay, to ensure an uninterrupted flow inflow of donations. Uh, we are also speaking to other nonprofits that depend on similar sub subscription models like News Laundry and Scroll to find solution to these challenges, to figure out a way around these woes. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? Additionally, we've partnered with Frankly Wearing, an online storefront to div diversify donor contribution methods. I will request somebody to please share the link in the chat box. Uh, we also host birthday fundraisers and match fundraisers with the help of kind supporters for our work. I can see Nemo has joined us. Thanks, Nemo, for your birthday fundraiser in December. It helped us a lot. Uh, we can now move to some quick organizational updates. Radhika Roy recently transitioned out of her role as litigation counsel at IFF. We miss her. Uh, she used to find these QMC so fun. And we are looking for a litigation counsel to steer the litigation vertical at IFF. Uh, the requirements include having four or more years of experience and being a fun person to work with. I will request someone to please link the hiring call in the chat chat box. In addition, we're also looking for enthusiastic volunteers to help us with tons of fun projects. For example, the free and fair website that Shravani was talking about was made possible by the efforts of our volunteer, Funny. Thanks, Funny. Currently, we are looking for a design volunteer and a data visualization volunteer to work with us on the upcoming Keep Us Online report. Please let us know if this is something that interests you. Can we move on to the next slide, please? As a solid team in this marathon for digital liberties, keep supporting and cheering us on, contribute to IFF and spread the word so your friends, family and others can also fund digital rights today. Thank you everyone for joining. I will now ask Pratik to take over and proceed. All right, thank you. Uh, I think we can probably, this is where we move to uh, the Q&A bit. I realize we've gone a little over, uh, but we'll still try to take in as many questions uh, as, you know, as, as they come in. So uh, if you'd like to raise your hand, we can unmute you. Or if you want to post them in the chat, that's fine as well. Uh, and, you know, maybe we can turn off the presentation every